We have a little ground to cover today, and it's going to be fun ground for you. I believe that if today you choose to apply just five minutes of your day to what we're going to be talking about, just five simple minutes that your life can be profoundly changed at the end or by the end of the year. Do you remember in January when we talked about New Year's resolutions and I asked you, how many of you are very happy with the person you were last year and there's nothing in your life that you want to change? And um, really nobody really raised their hand and said, yeah, I'm perfect. I'm excellent in every way. When I look in the mirror, I look back and go, yep, you've arrived, you've made it. Nobody said that. And well, if you did, you didn't say it out loud, which at least shows some self-awareness. Everyone said, no, there's things that I want to change. I want to grow. Now, do you remember when I asked you, what are you going to do? Do you have steps in your life? Have you put anything in your life to help you grow? Do you remember how many of you raised your hands? Not very many. And you remember the disappointed look on my face? I was like, oh. How are we going to get where we want to go if we don't have steps to get there? And so this whole series is on some steps to be able to grow. Now, I believe discipline is um, consistent in all areas of life. I believe discipline is important physically. I believe it's important emotionally and relationally. I believe discipline is important spiritually. And I believe that discipline is very simple. Sometimes it's just doing something today that we may not always want to do to get something or gain something tomorrow that we won't have otherwise. Does that make sense? Or choosing not to do something today because tomorrow we want to see something that not doing that today will help us achieve. And the spiritual discipline is no different. Some days you want to, some days you don't want to, and it doesn't really matter because we're disciplined people. Nobody has to remind me in the morning to drink coffee. I wake up in the morning and the first thing I think about when I wake up is coffee. And I think of whose day is it to make the coffee? Because Joy and I switch back and forth, usually making coffee. And, um, and I wake up and I smell. And if I don't smell the coffee, then I know it's probably my day. So I get up and I go in and I make the coffee. I think about it right off the bat. I don't have to think about eating breakfast. I'm usually hungry in the morning. I don't have to, have, have to remind me. Pastor Dan doesn't have to call me or text me saying, hey, Rick, don't forget to eat breakfast today. I just think about it. I don't have to forget to do the things that are important to me, the things that I want to do because I've decided that these things are important and I've never been so busy that the important things I don't have time for. And growing spiritually is something we often make excuses about. I don't have time. I don't think about it. My life is too busy. And just like everything else, if we don't do it, if we're not engaged, if we're not active, then we're not going to change. And the last thing that I want for us is to end the year the same as we finished last year for us not to be spiritually changed. I want us to be more like Jesus. Do you want that in your own life? Do you wanna be more like Jesus? Do you wanna think more like him? Do you wanna react more like him? Do you wanna forgive more like Jesus? Do you wanna respond like Jesus? Do you wanna stay out of trouble like Jesus stayed out of trouble? Do you wanna invest your days like Jesus invested his days? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does in us. And so today I'm gonna to talk to you about something that you might be tempted to dismiss. And that something is prayer. Prayer is simply talking to God and we make it weird. We make it complicated. We make it convoluted. We make it structured. And in reality, prayer is the most simple and natural thing that a person could ever do. God formed you in your mother's womb. And as he and before he formed you, the Bible says he knew you. And when he created you in your mother's womb, he installed in you the ability to communicate with him. And it's not weird and it's not super structured and it's not formal. It's the most natural thing in the world. But prayer is often something we only do when we get in trouble, like the Hail Mary in football. Do you know the play, the Hail Mary, when a team is out of options and out of time? They don't have any more downs. The yardage is too far to overcome. What do they do? The quarterback drops back and he throws the ball as far as he can. And he hopes that somebody will run and catch it in the end zone or somewhere else because it's a last ditch effort. Many times we only pray the Hail Mary prayer. Fortunately, God's a God who's gracious enough that even if we haven't prayed in a long time, he is still there and able, willing, interested in receiving prayers of even those of us who throw up those Hail Marys from time to time. One of the craziest incidences in scripture on prayer or about prayer that I think I've ever seen is one I wanna share with you to get your attention. And I bet if you could pray these same kinds of prayers, you probably would. 
but it's found in 2 Kings. And I don't know if you've even heard this story or not. I talked to my wife this morning who has been in church since she was negative nine months old. And I'm not gonna tell you how many years that is because she would be upset, but it's a long time. And she'd never heard this story before. No Sunday school teacher ever talked to her about it. It was never on a flannel graph. It was never in children's church. And really you don't hear many messages or, or, or sermons about it. Are you interested in hearing what it is? It's the story of Elisha and two bears. And one of the craziest prayers that could ever be prayed and God answered it. Well, I'm just gonna read it to you. Elisha, he left Jericho and he went up to Bethel. Now Bethel was like the hotbed of idol worship in the Northern kingdom of Israel. And Elisha was a newly appointed prophet who had just taken over the responsibilities from Elijah. Elisha, Elijah, if you read your Old Testament, they, you can get confused back and forth between the two of them. But Elisha had just taken over in a really crazy supernatural way, crossed a river supernaturally, went back across, whirlwind, Elijah goes to heaven, Elisha takes the mantle with a double portion of, of uh, Elijah's spirit, and off he goes. So Elijah, Elisha is going up to Bethel, and he was walking along the road, a group of boys from the town begin mocking him. What were they saying? Now, some of you in here are going to like this, right? Um, some of them were saying, go away, baldy, they chanted. Go away. Anybody bald in here? Anyone? Uh, you don't have to raise your hands. I can see. <laughs> it's all right. I shaved my head for 13 years. I loved it. Um, it was so nice to be able to just take, you know, just one soap and head and everything, shoulders, knees and toes and showers in three minutes. I get it. But anyway, they were making fun of Elisha for being bald. Now, nobody knows exactly why he was bald. It could have been natural. It could have been him shaving his head to identify as a prophet. Could have been that he was balding and aging. But the reality is that they were chanting, go away, baldy, go away. So Elijah turned around and looked at the boys and then he prayed to heaven. And he said, now the translation is that he cursed them to the Lord. And then two bears, she bears, mama bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 People, if you could pray bears on your enemies, would you be a prayer? Somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're like, wait a second, <laughs> your hand goes to God and there they come, the bears. I mean, that would be something else, wouldn't it? Uh, the problem is, is that we would pray bears on lots of people and our enemies are not God's enemies and we're not Elisha and that's not the Old Testament. And, and really the context is misunderstood. First of all, the King James, they translated this children. And the first time I read this when I was a kid, I'm like, are you kidding me? God kills children with bears? I was scared to go in the woods. That's a mistranslation. The word children is young men. There were probably, yeah, they were around 20 years old and um, there were a bunch of them and they were blocking the way for Elisha to do his, his work. And so as he called out to the Lord, he's like, hey, this isn't my job. You gave me the job. I'm doing what you want me to do. You can stop these guys if you want to. Um, it's up to you, God. And so God chose to do it with bears. Isn't that a crazy prayer? I mean, the Old Testament's full of prayers like that, that God seems to answer. And there's power there and God always accomplishes his will. Um, I've never prayed bears on anybody and maybe you haven't either, but I hope I have your attention. The disciples had been taught how to pray as Jewish men, they had seen prayer become formal, become boring, become wordy. You ever heard a formal, boring, wordy prayer before? I love hearing new Christians pray. You know why? Because they're not formal, they're not wordy, and they're not boring. What I hate is when people have been around church for a while and they become older Christians, and then they start praying, and their prayers are formal, they're wordy, and they're boring, because we think that we have to impress the people who are around us who hear our prayers. So we can speak with the King James. If we were playing uh, Scrabble, we would have some you know, really high-scoring words, and really it doesn't impress anybody. It certainly doesn't impress God, and all we're doing is just rattling our mouth like an empty gong or a clanging cymbal. I know you've heard prayers like that. And the disciples had heard prayers like that. They'd seen the Pharisees choose to pray on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the marketplace so that they could stop at certain times and throw up their hands to heaven in the middle of a crowd and say, God, thank you. I'm not like the dirt bags in this place. Loud. And then they would go and recite scripture and everybody would say, oh, they're so holy. They're so separate. They're so obnoxious. They're so irrelevant. 
And the disciples had memorized prayers. And they were taught to, to say these memorized prayers at certain festivals and at certain times, and those were okay. But they watched Jesus. They were hanging out with Jesus, and they saw that Jesus prayed differently. He prayed like a new Christian, even though he was God. He wasn't boring. He wasn't wordy. He wasn't formal. He was talking to his dad, and the disciples were blown away. They were saying prayer used to be something we had to do. Now it's something we want to do. And then they looked at Jesus, and we find this story in Luke chapter 11. They looked at him, and they said, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Now, Jesus, they'd seen him pray on a bunch of different occasions and pray from the heart, sometimes by himself, sometimes in front of them. But he prayed um, for a number of, of reasons. One of the reasons was he prayed when he was grieving the death of John the Baptist. Once when he was uh, in his own life, he was at the end of his life and he was in a time of trouble. Once when he was trying to forgive and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He, he prayed when he needed direction for ministry. I mean, Jesus prayed over and over and over and over again. And the disciples, as they were enamored by it, they decided that they were going to ask Jesus how to pray. And so in Luke chapter 11, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. And so Jesus repeated some instructions that we find in Matthew chapter 6, which was the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, when you pray, he said, pray like this. Now the disciples lick a pencil and got their paper and started to get ready to write things down. But the reality was that this was the second time that Jesus had taught them how to pray the exact same way. The first time in Matthew chapter six, they listened, but they really weren't hearing. Jesus said, keep it simple, keep it real, keep it from the heart. If you want some themes to pray about, here are some themes that'll guide your thoughts. But the disciples thought that was too simple for them. They wanted the deep stuff. Teach us the magic words, God. Teach us how to unlock the treasures of heaven. And Jesus said, okay, I'm going to explain it to you again, this time in fewer words with fewer points. And he did it in the book of Luke chapter 11. And in Luke chapter 11, one through four, we see the scriptures tell us that as Jesus was praying in a certain place and left that place, the disciples finally came to him and they said, all right, we want you to show us. We don't want to be boring. We don't want to be wordy. We don't want to be formal. We want to know how to talk to God like he's our best friend with respect because he's God, but from the heart because he's personal. And Jesus said, all right, I'll tell you. He said, I'll tell you again. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven. Now you're praying to a spiritual father and you may not have had a very good father so this could be a non-starter for some of you. But imagine a perfect father who's attentive, who's involved, who listens, who communicates, who's fair, who's loving, who you trust. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray our father. The word he used is Abba, daddy. I have a two-year-old granddaughter. Her name's Emery. You all know that by now. And I'll keep talking about Emery for a long, long time until I have another grandkid and I'll talk about them too. Last time we were in Arkansas, I had the privilege with my wife as we do when we're there of putting her to bed. She has these little bunk beds and her little bottom bunk's on the floor. There's like no lift off. I mean, you gotta like get down on the floor and roll into the bunk. And Joy always goes on the wall side of Emory and I always go on the outside of Emory. It's like the aisle seat in a plane. It's more comfortable. You can hang a leg out, right? And so Emory's in the middle and we're laying there. And I always read her a Bible story because that's what you do. You know, when little kids are young, you read them Bible stories because you want them to grow up and learn the truths in scripture. And so as Emory and Joy and I are laying there in the bed, um, I read her the Bible story and then we're done. And I hear Richard, my son from the other room say, don't forget to pray. Now I prayed with the boys every night. I mean, almost every single night growing up because I wanted to pray with them. And it had been a long time since I prayed with a two-year-old, a long time. 
Now I pray in front of you guys all the time, right? And I can be wordy and I can be formal. I try not to be because it's not how I view prayer. I can probably even be boring, but I promise you a wordy, formal, boring prayer is not what my two-year-old wanted. She was having a hard time paying attention to the Bible story book with pictures in it. And my prayers don't have pictures. And so Richard said, don't forget to pray. And I had a little freak out moment, right? I'm like, what am I going to pray with a two-year-old? Because I want her to get it. So I'm thinking about what does she care about, right? Well, let's pray that there are no spiders in her tent, right? I mean, that's a good thing, right? She's got one little friend from preschool who she really likes. Let's pray for Sam, right? Let's pray for, you know, I mean, she, what does she love? She loves Elsa. We didn't pray for Elsa, but, you know, she loves Elsa and she loves her teddy bear and mama and dada. And, you know, and so I'll go through all the things that I think are important to her. And I pray for those things. And I'm kind of watching to see if she's engaged. And I wouldn't tell you she's riveted and hanging on every word, but I can tell you she was tracking with me. And it was my job as a grandfather to pray in a way that met her on her level. Because if I had chosen to try to impress her with all my preacher words, first of all, it would have bored her silly. And secondly, it would have taught her that prayer is not for her. And you know people, unfortunately, have been doing that to you for a long time. A good father, God the Father, gets down in the bed with us, rolls over close, and communicates to us in a way that we understand about the things that are important to us and teaches us the things that are important to him as we grow. Now, when Emory turns 12, if I'm sitting there in a chair praying for her before she goes to bed, I'm gonna pray a different way because she's growing. Her world's gonna be a little bit bigger than three feet. We'll probably move beyond no spiders in the tent and for a good day at preschool. But God the Father meets you right where you are and leans down to your level and doesn't judge you or belittle you, he embraces you. And when Jesus said to the disciples, when you pray, this is the way you pray. Our Father, it was powerful. It was life-changing. And it motivated them to hear more. So when you and I come back together in a few minutes, I wanna break this down for you and I wanna share with you what Jesus himself told the disciples. And then I'm gonna ask you for five minutes a day over the next six days. That's it. I'm gonna ask for five minutes a day. Many of you spend eight hours at work or more, 30 minutes in the gym or more, five minutes a day to change your life. And I'm gonna give you a tool to take with you that if you use, I believe it'll help you accomplish what it might be that God's trying to do in your life today. We had a holiday last week called Valentine's Day. And uh, I don't know if you are romantic, if you celebrate Valentine's Day or not. I um, am probably uh, romantically um, challenged. How about that? I, I, I try and joy helps. But um, sometimes it's, uh, it's just not what I'm thinking about all the time. You know, being romantic and dates and things like that, planning stuff. And it doesn't mean I shouldn't do it. It just means I'm not good at it. And so Wednesday was Valentine's Day. And I certainly didn't want to go out um, in the evening and uh, fight the crowds or the traffic. So I took Joy to lunch. And we went to lunch at a restaurant that... Um, it was um, not on our diet. Let me just say it that way, okay? So it was a splurge. And this was a restaurant that had the calories written in next to the item that they have on the menu so that you could peruse the menu and then you could see the damage you were doing to your body at the same time as you were ordering the food. And so Joy and I sat there and we said, ha, ah, this is Valentine's Day. So why don't we just splurge and let's just eat what we want? And so we did. And after we were done, I remember sitting there thinking, that my body was telling me, you are going to pay for this later. Because 
I knew I just wasn't going to feel good. Isn't it weird how sometimes on a special occasion we celebrate by doing something to our bodies that we know we shouldn't do that we're going to pay for later, but we think we deserve to celebrate? In some cases, when we even sit down to eat what we eat, we say, you know what? Our body's going to say thank you. In our relationship with a spouse or a child, there are certain times when things come up. The other day, Joy wanted to talk about something that I didn't want to talk about. Does that ever happen to you? It wasn't a big thing. It was just a thing. And she wanted to talk and I wasn't in the mood. And so my first response was to not talk about it. Whatever way I could get out of it, you know, that was up to me, but not to talk about it. And I had this thought, if I choose not to engage and to talk when she really needs to talk, um, it might be good for me in the moment, but I know my relationship will say, you're going to pay for that later where thankfully this time I engaged and we talked and I listened and I paid attention and I knew that my relationship would thank me. Spiritually, we have choices that are just the same. When we sit down to watch TV, Netflix, Joy and I have been watching lots of true crime documentaries. My goodness, we gotten into them. She loves them. Any of you ladies like them? Something about women that seem to really like these things. I see a lot of you nodding your heads. These like true crimes, the serial killer lives next door or with me or whatever it is. And so we've been watching a lot of that stuff, Dateline, 48 Hours, 2020, um, getting into some stuff. And, um, and sometimes when we're watching stuff on Netflix, I, I stop and I ask myself, is this something, and not just those shows, but just in general, movies, whatever, is this something that I should watch and that my spirit is going to say thank you? Or is this something I should watch and my spirit is saying you're going to pay me later? You'll pay for this later. I think we live a lot of life like that, having to choose if we're going to do things that our bodies, that our relationships, that our spirit will thank us for, or if we are doing things that we're going to have to pay for later, things we may or may not be able to overcome. The disciples, as they were asking Jesus how to pray, he was teaching them to pray in a way that their soul would say, thank you. Where the Pharisees were praying in a way where the reality was they would have to pay for it later. They were praying in a way to put people down, to show how holy they were. And they would have to pay for that later. Jesus was offering the disciples a way to pray where their soul would say, thank you, because they're able to finally connect with God. And so he gave them six very simple principles in this sort of redacted prayer. Matthew 6, the first time he gave this prayer, when he said, pray in a manner like this, it was a little more cumbersome, a little more words, a few more points. And so Jesus said, in a sense, let me dumb it down for you. Cookies on the bottom shelf, because this is where most of us are living, right? And so he gave us six very simple things that I have given to you. They're in your notes. If you have your app, you can download those or you can get them off the website. They look like this, two pages, six different boxes, and um, they are pretty simple. I got up early yesterday morning. I wasn't satisfied with how I had left the sermon on Thursday to apply it for you. And I, got, I just wrote this for you just because I wanted to be able to help make something so practical that if you took this and put it in your hands... Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then come back here next Sunday, and you just do this and give five minutes a day to this, your soul is going to say, thank you. And so Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Now I'm gonna work through these six things very quickly, and you have them in your notes, and I want you to print these out and take these with you during your day, because these are some themes that you can pray for. Do it in five minutes. Don't spend any longer than five minutes. I had all sorts of formulas in my mind. One of these you would focus on each day. Maybe you would do all of them in one day, one day, and then one of them the next day. You can do whatever you want. There's no right or wrong. But Jesus said, listen, when you pray to the disciples, pray in a manner that's something like this. He says, our father, and he says, who lives in heaven, hallowed be your name. The very first thing that we do is we say, God, I love you. And I love you because you're important to me. I love you because you are loving, because you are gracious, because you are full of mercy, because you're a God who created everything. You're a God who doesn't give up on me. And you tell him how much you love him. Prayers of adoration. 
Spend 30 seconds writing out, if you want to, a list of things in your life or in your mind. Not thank you lists, not things he's done for you, but attributes about his character, things that make him God, things that make you stand back and just say, wow. Now, it's not because he's an egomaniac and needs this. It's because we need to do it and to posture ourselves correctly in front of him. So start out your five minute prayer time and you can do this in five minutes. You'll have to hurry. It's okay. You say your mind wanders. It will not wander if you try this. You say it's hard to pay attention. You will not have a hard time paying attention if you follow this formula. It'll solve some problems. But start off this way. God, I wanna tell you how great you are and I love you because. Write them out, say them, whatever you wanna do. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed isn't a Halloween word. It just means you're amazing and this is why. And then he moves on to the next theme, which is important. And he says, God, today I give you my wanter. I don't want the right things. And I know that if I get the stuff that I want, I won't be in the right place. So I give you my wanter. What I want in life now belongs to you. Change my heart and what I want. Are you ready to pray that? Are you prepared to pray that? What do you want in life? This is so much deeper than you may think on the surface. You are relinquishing control. When you say, God, if you give me what I want, chances are it's not what I need. It's just all I know. I'm trying to meet a legitimate need, but maybe in an illegitimate way. And so God, this morning I present to you my wanter. This evening I'm giving you my wanter. Help me to want the right kinds of things. Trust in the Lord and do good. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire because he changes the desire of your heart. Does that make sense? You morph and all of a sudden the things that are important to you are not quite as important to you and you begin to awaken spiritually. Trust him and he will help you. All right, that's just number two. Number three. It continues to get uh, more interesting, more engaging. Uh, This is an easy one. God, we really need these things. Give us this day, us being you and me, you and the people close to you. I need some things, God. These are the things that I need. And these are the things my friends need, my family. By including other people in your prayers, your circle begins to grow and you become aware of God doing some things that you didn't see him do and that you don't understand. You become others focused and occupied, not just focused with yourself and occupied. You can't pray for everybody, but you can pray for some people. And so you pray, God, these are the things I think I really need. And I have some friends or family who are hurting too. And they need protection, they need provision, they need healing, they need grace. They need love. And just for a few seconds, because you don't have much time, pour your heart out for yourself and for your friends. And number four, you ready? We can move to the next one. You jogging with me? We're picking up the pace a little bit. You track, I, I can't see through these spotlights. Are you guys tracking with me? Just say yes. It makes it go faster. All right. Okay. Thank you. That helps so much. You'd have no idea. Okay. The next one. This is so, so important. Jesus is saying, when you pray, remember to pray for your daily bread, but remember to pray for forgiveness. Forgive us our sins. Remember that restaurant that I told you we went to on Wednesday? Um, the hostess at the, west, at the restaurant, when we checked in, um, she said something weird to me. And when people you know, they're in the service industry say weird things, it strikes me funny and I laugh usually. I go to a coffee shop sometimes and when I pay for the coffee in the drive through the person who hands me the coffee oftentimes says, do you want a receipt at all? That's how she says it. Do you want a receipt at all? And it makes me chuckle. And I don't know if that sounds funny to you or not, but I either want a receipt or I don't, but at all is like there's a degree in between. And so I laugh. I'm like, I just want one a little bit. So you decide. It's a dumb thing. I know I'm picking on people. So the, the hostess at this restaurant, um, when I gave my name, she said, uh, do you have a good name you can give me? And so I start laughing and Joyce says, stop. And she elbows me. And I said, excuse me. And she goes, do you have a good name you can give me? And I said, well, I like my name just fine. Um, but I guess people can be giving you bad names. And then I thought about it. What's the best name you can be given? Forgiven. 
because we have thoughts, actions, and attitudes that displease God. And when we ask for forgiveness, it's not because God needs it, it's because we do. It helps us to grieve over the things that we've done to not commit the same sins and sin blocks our relationship with God. It creates a fog that's almost impossible to see through. And so I examine my heart and if you wanna get Catholic for a minute, you can go the seven deadly sin route, which is really helpful and kind of fun. And if you don't think that you have any sins in your life, you could go through the checklist and you could say, all right, well, I'm gonna check myself against this. Do I have any pride? Do I have any anger? How's my lust? Envy, greed, sloth, gluttony? Am I overindulging in anything? And if you can get through that list of seven things without being convicted and leased by God, you're a better person than me because I've tried it for four days and I haven't made it through three things without having to say, all right, God, you got me. And it's not because I'm having to, to admit defeat. It's because I'm having to admit weakness and dependence on God. Confession is not about God making a cosmic ledger correct so that it's, he can make the accounting justify at the end of the day. Me asking for forgiveness positions me correctly before God and helps me to live in a way that pleases him, but also helps me become the person he wants me to be. You see, you've got a lot to do in five minutes, right? But I'm just asking for five minutes. Maybe one day you take a few more minutes on one of these things up to you. Just five minutes a day over time will change your life. Five minutes a day between now and the end of December, December 31st, 2024, you can be a different person. I promise you, take my word for it. But moving right along, we're not done with Jesus' simple cliff note version of the disciples' request on teaching us to pray in a way where our soul will say, thank you. We're supposed to ask for forgiveness as we are giving forgiveness. And so then we move on and we say, all right, God, here are some people in my life who I'm having a hard time forgiving. And you, maybe you write down a person or two. Maybe you don't have anybody. God, I mean, wouldn't that be awesome if you didn't have anybody in your life you thought you needed to forgive? My experience is that most people feel like there's at least somebody. So you write them down and you say, God, I forgive and help me keep forgiving. Because tomorrow I might not feel like that. And what they did might not be right. It might not be legal. There may need consequences. I may not have a restored relationship, but you know what? I'm giving it to you because I can't carry this today. You didn't create me for this weight and I'm not gonna carry it around. God, I forgive them. Help me to keep forgiving. Okay, this is in your five minutes. We even have more. This is the next one. God, I'm forgiving and trying to forgive. And this is the last one. And this is one of my favorites. And by the way, God, help me stay out of trouble. Um, deliver me from temptation. From those stupid traps that I'm going to step in because I step in them all the time. And from those blind spots where they sneak up from behind me and get me. The things that'll come from within because I'm an idiot and the things that'll come from without because the world is sneaky. Help me today, God. Lead me not into temptation. Take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. Don't let me drift toward evil or take any part in acts of wickedness. Don't let me share in the delicacies of those who do wrong or whatever psalm or prayer you want to pray. And can you imagine after you spend just five minutes working through this, perhaps even with this little list of six in front of you, not only will your mind continue to think about these things, which is a lot of transformation. Remember Romans 12, one and two. Don't be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know what God's good, pleasing and perfect will really is. Some spiritual, perhaps over-spiritual people feel like this is too basic. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. The Bible says, pray about everything. Those things are true. But most people I know don't live in a world where we pray without ceasing and where we pray about everything. To be perfectly transparent with you, many of the people I know really only pray when it's time for a Hail Mary or perhaps to tip their hat to God in a situation where they think it might bring good luck. And God has created in us the ability to connect with him, a communication pipeline 
where he meets you as an infant, as he lays next to you in bed, as a 12 year old, where the bed's not big enough for three of you and your conversations grow and mature just like you as a person and as a 30 year old, as you have a little age and a few scars, a little experience, the temptation to be preoccupied with the rear view. And he walks with you and transforms you and does something in you that's amazing. He makes you like Jesus. But you have to decide if it's worth it because nobody can do it for you. So will you with me take five minutes over the next six days and just look at this simple list. Work through this list. Even if you think it's dumb or trivial or too elementary for you and your station or place, just give it a shot. And at the end of the six days, I want you to look back and evaluate. And if it's not worth it, throw it in the trash. But I know at some point along the way, some traction is going to begin and a prayer life within you is going to open up and it'll change everything. Father, thank you so much for my friends and I pray that as we contemplate this super simple spiritual truth as Jesus put the cookies on the bottom shelf and even made a simple instruction from Matthew chapter six, even more simple in Luke chapter 11. The disciples asking for depth, thinking they were mature Jesus pointing them toward the most basic things. Toward the need that we have to acknowledge how great you are. Toward the need that we have to, to tell you what we need and to ask you for these things, to offer you our will, our wanter, to begin to relinquish control to ask for forgiveness, to confess the things that we do and have done that are wrong, to ask your strength not to do them anymore, to acknowledge the present and the past, but make a promise for the future. But not just to ask for forgiveness, Father, but to forgive others and, and then just the simple request to keep us out of trouble so that we can continue on this path. I pray, Father, we would embrace this, that we would do it. And I love my friends, Lord. I believe in them and I know how hard they're trying and I know we live in a world that is set up to try to make us fail but you are greater than the world and this is what you want so it's what we want so be with us this week as we do something that will allow our soul to say thank you in Jesus name I pray amen